morning. It's great to see you. He is risen. Okay, all right, that's not too bad. I know we have a lot of guests, and, and sometimes maybe you're new or you're a first-timer, and that's awesome. Welcome. My name is Pastor Matt. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here, one of the teaching pastors. I want to begin with this call and response because it's been going on for centuries. Anytime a believer on resurrection morning comes across another believer, they loudly declare, he is risen. And the person opposite them, even louder, declares back, he is risen indeed. All right, let's try one more time. He is risen. He is risen. Woo! Yes, he is. Resurrection Sunday, the day that changed everything. I love it. On that first resurrection morning, the world had changed. Things were not going to be the same anymore. No longer were little sacrifices of bulls and rams and goats going to be enough. They never were. But the beautiful, spotless, perfect Lamb of God took our sin. And if that's new to you or foreign, that is awesome. I hope you hear this. I hope you open your heart and hear a truth that I heard for the first time when I was a teenager, and it changed my world. I kind of thought, I'm just going to be a good person. Right? I'm just going to get along, not, you know, not murder anybody. At the end of life, put my, my good and my bad on the scale, and if it outraged, well, I'm in, you know. Oh, it's so much more than that. Not just about then, it's about having abundant life now, about having purpose and passion. And things are not the same. In fact, it would take some time before even Jesus' closest disciples would really get the gravity of all that had changed. Things weren't the same. Things didn't look the same. You know, maybe if you, if you kind of squinted with one eye, you weren't really sure. And even today, I think sometimes we get caught up. Things may not be all that they seem. And if you don't believe me, let me put up a picture here. And you tell me if things were the same, if things looked the same uh, to you or maybe not. Because I think a couple years ago, this went around and half the world saw a gold dress. And half the world saw a blue dress. But it was the same dress. And who saw gold? Who saw blue? See what I'm saying? Who's right? Or maybe this one right here. There's a famous picture of Albert Einstein going around. And they look closely, but some people, when they squint their eyes and lean back, they don't see Albert Einstein. They see somebody else. Who? Marilyn Monroe, right? <laughs> I can't get far different than that. You see it? Some of you are saying, like, oh, it is that, right? Things are different. How about this? What do you see here? Do you see a levitating trash can and a floating car, an SUV? Because a lot of people do. A lot of people swear these things are defying the laws of gravity. Or is it just your mind playing tricks because of shadows and puddles? Or how about this one? When you look at this, do you see an Easter bunny looking to the right? Or do you see a duck looking to the left? And while you stare at that duck, does that circle move? And then when you look at it, it stops. But if I look at his eye, I feel like it's just moving just a little bit. See, things aren't always what they seem. And that applies to what happened the last week of Jesus' life. The brutal mockery of a trial and crucifixion, the cross, being laid in a borrowed empty tomb, sealed, the guard stationed in front, not just a guard, but a garrison, 12, 15, lots of seasoned soldiers protecting a, a dead man? What is happening? Oh, and then something else happened on that first resurrection morning. The stone rolled away and it was beyond reason. I think one of the things that I love so much about this, this day that we celebrate is it blows people's minds. And we forget all that Jesus really went through. We did a great job kind of, of painting the picture, singing through some of the lyrics of, of what he went through. But do you remember, I want to kind of start with the cross and just recap, because if you haven't thought about what the cross really is, or maybe you weren't here last week, we looked at the cross, we forget that it is a cruel instrument of execution. It's barbaric. It's mean, it's ugly, it's humiliating. The people are stripped nearly naked. They're spat upon. They're, I mean, it's just, it's the worst. And yet we talked about if we were to go back then wearing our gold and platinum and unobtainium colored crosses and, and tesseract, whatever you want to put on it, you know, to make it look fancy, they would be stunned. Like, why are you dressing up an instrument of torture? It would be like us walking around today with a gold-plated electric chair or a, a hyper, hyperdermic uh, syringe, like a lethal injection, walking in with a gold plate, be like, what are you doing? We forget the cross before it was beautiful was barbaric. It was hurtful. It was a place of torture. And I think when I look at it this week, I always see these great memes coming across the line. And probably my favorite picture of the cross when it deals with the resurrection is this one right here. 
of this girl. It gets me every time. Showing, I mean, without batting an eye, she, I'm sure she was holding hands with mom and dad. She runs off, and she just is trying to show love to our Lord who's got the weight of the world in the form of a cross on his back. It says it all. And then I saw another picture of something that happened just this week, I believe in South America. They were doing a passion play. And you may not be familiar with those, but they act out a lot of the last week from Golgotha through the Garden of Gethsemane all the way through to the, to the crucifixion site, the Via Dolorosa and all that. And they have this picture here of the actor who's playing Jesus. And you see the centurions and the guards kind of off to the side. You'll see him in another photo where he's already been beaten and mocked. They've got the crown of thorns on him. They've got the, the purple robe of nobility. They're mocking Jesus saying, oh, you're the king of the Jews. You can't even save yourself. What a pathetic person. But something happened that no one could expect. Out of the crowd, without being prompted, there was a sign of compassion. A puppy, a little German shepherd puppy, couldn't understand why people were being so mean to this man. Couldn't understand why are people doing that. And he was doing the best he could to come and give comfort and show compassion. And I love it because the resurrection is the day that showed us broken and barbaric things can be made beautiful. It's the day that took things like as cruel and gross as the cross and turned it into something that we proudly and rightfully so wear around our neck, plated with gold. The resurrection is so powerful, so all-encompassing, it can take what is known as a symbol of death and turn it into a symbol of life. What it does for humanity is amazing. I want to look at two things as we celebrate today with over 2 billion people across the globe. There's two realities here. First one is acknowledging that the event was real and it took place. We're going to be a little apologetical on you here in the first part. And the second thing is the overwhelming beauty that happens, what this transformation that comes from the resurrection. And that's the first truth I want to leave us with today. Without the resurrection, the cross is barbaric. <clears throat> and honestly, it's meaningless. Let's just be honest. What's the point? Just another criminal being killed on a torture device. But with the resurrection, the cross is our hope. It is our life. Over in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is foretelling of his death. He's talking about his resurrection. But still, even then, not everyone fully got it. I want you to read the words with me. He says this. He says, he, then Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man might suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, by the chief priests, by the teachers of the law. These are people who should know about the Messiah, by the way. And all that must happen, he must be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke plainly about this. And Peter, right, his right-hand man, took him aside <laughs> and began to rebuke him. What? Peter, taking the Lord's side, Lord, you can't talk like this. You don't know what you're saying, right? This is how important this event is. Jesus' resurrection is going to prove once and for all all of his words are true. Or it was going to reveal it was history's hoax. Since Jesus rose from the grave, we know now that all who believe in that can be raised from the grave as well. Everything hinges on this central fact. This is why we make such a big deal about this. This is why the resurrection changes everything. Paul actually takes it a step farther in 1 Corinthians. Look with me. He says, and if Christ hasn't been raised, oh, guess what? Your faith is futile. <laughs> Your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Like, what's the point? I love, he just cuts right to the noise. He says, then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died early, they're lost. If it's only for this life that we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Isn't that great? Oh, what a pitiful group. If that's all there is. But, oh, this is it. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through a man, talk about Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, Jesus, sometimes called the second Adam. There's a Bible scholar named John Whale. He said this, he says, belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. This is the proof that everything Jesus did was true. Everything he said was right. When Jesus claimed in John 14, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. When he said that, he was making an exclusive claim. He was saying, watch me. I will conquer death. And in three days, I will come back. And I will show you that I have shattered the chains of death and sin. And I will bring those with me who believe in this. The majority of the world still doesn't accept and doesn't like the exclusive claims of Christ. Do you know that? Those who believe that are called narrow-minded. <laughs> oh, you're not one of those anti-science people that believe, oh, let's go science. I'm happy to go there with it. The exclusive claims of Christ that the resurrection proves everything. I read just this week about a world-famous golfer. I'm not a big golfer, but even I know who this guy is. Shout it out if you know his name. You know it. The great one. The legend. The living legend. This famous golfer was actually doing a, uh, a big private session for the top business and entertainment executives. About 30 people gathered, and they were all at, uh, I believe it was one of the Trump golf course in Los Angeles. And they were having that annual thing he calls Tee It Up with Tiger Woods. And it's a special event, not just anybody can go, it's all the rich executives and famous people. And this, this session includes a private lesson with the legend himself. Then you get to eat lunch with him, just a little intimate group. And then after that, you get her hand in a microphone, and everybody gets to ask him a single question right there in front of everybody. And it's this really cool, intimate moment with the legend himself. And they would go around the room, and all 29 people in the room went and asked these great questions. Most were things like, hey, how do I get my golf score better, and what would you recommend about my swing? And then they got to the last guy, who was a guest of Nike on this day. And they handed him the mic, and he did not ask one question. He asked two questions in rapid order. And his questions were this, sir, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if not, would you prayerfully consider doing that now? They said you could hear a pin drop. Some were mortified. Some gasped. Others looked from the question asker to Tiger. <laughs> like, what is he going to say in this moment? I have his response. Listen closely and see if you can spot the flaw. He says, and he was unflappable, by the way, to his credit. He said, you know what? My father was a Christian. So, of course, Christianity is a part of my life. But my mother is Buddhist. She's Asian. And this is also a part of my childhood. So I practice both faiths respectfully. Now, this might sound good on the surface until you go back to what the Bible says. <laughs> So you go back to what we just heard Jesus when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. There's not many roads to God. There's not all kinds. Just believe what you want. Be sincere. You could be sincerely wrong. There's a lot of people sincerely wrong. A lot of people who are just religious. Can I just be honest? Can I just say, I can't stand religious people. You know what I'm talking about? There's some of the most legalistic, annoying, obnoxious people on the planet. I'd like to deal with people who have a relationship with Jesus, who get it, who know that he's the only one perfect, we're not. He's our goal, we try to be like that, but this shine of glory, I, I, I'm not going to make it quite to perfection, but one day, one day, I will be transformed, and so will you if you know the Savior. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know what? And this was the beautiful thing. That way is available to Tiger Woods. It's available to you. It's available to me. Everyone on this planet who will accept his offer. That's the beauty of the Resurrection Sunday. It, it makes us all equals. If God is your father, then I am your brother, period. There's no room for egos. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And scholars can argue all day long about, well, Jesus meant this, or his, his parables meant this. And blah, blah. No, no, no. Not a serious scholar exists on earth who disputes the fact Jesus was a historical man who lived, who died, who was crucified. We see all kinds of evidence outside of the scriptures. Not Bible stuff. I'm talking outside, secular witnesses that also attest to this, who prove not only did the resurrection or the, the, the crucifixion happen, but something happened on that resurrection morn that they can't explain. And something really happened to those 12 whacked out disciples who really should have denied this whole thing and saved themselves a lot of trouble. But something changed them. And I love reading what these non-Christians thought. People who are eyewitnesses. People like that famous Jewish historian, Josephus, who wrote about this. He also mentioned Pontius Pilate by name and what he did, crucified him. I mean, we see this kind of evidence. Another great secular example is the annals of imperial Rome. 
This was written not long after Jesus rose from the dead by a Roman senator and historian, Cornelius Tacitus. And he wrote this. He says, Christus, their founder of the group, right, was put to death by Pontius Pilate. Do you see the details he's given? Now, this is not a fan. This is not somebody who's, who's pro. And I love, as you read further, he's, he says, but the pernicious superstition repressed for a time, like we had it under control, but then it broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the whole city of... It sounds like a bad Scooby-Doo episode, doesn't it? Like, I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling disciples. I just pictured this, ah, oh, can you hear the disdain? Can you sense it just dripping from the... the, the they're already, like... Ew, about Christians. <laughs> Thankfully, nobody feels that way today. <laughs> like, hey, we're all looked up to. We're just, oh, I wouldn't, no. No, we still are broken in need of a Savior. We just admit we need to be forgiven. We come to the one who can offer forgiveness. After Tacitus, there was a Roman governor, Plinius the Younger, who actually complained in a letter about how the early Christians that he was persecuting and punished, he complained because they were so joyful. He literally is quoted saying, I can't understand how these people could sing hymns to Christ as if they were singing to a God. Can you just hear the derision in his voice? There was disdain for the early church even back then. In lawyer terms, Dr. Paul Meyer calls this positive evidence from a hostile source. In other words, if a source admits a fact that is decidedly not in his favor, then that fact is likely genuine. These people had nothing to gain by admitting what had happened. They weren't believers. They weren't friendly to Christianity. So many other witnesses confirmed something monumental, something transforming had taken place. Even pagan Roman rulers testified, man, those who knew Jesus best, they ain't the same people. We grew up with them. We fished with them. We went to the parties together. We know about their past. And now they're different brings us to a great ugly reality that again turns beautiful of all the convincing proofs of Jesus and his resurrection. I think to me the most powerful by far is the reaction of those 12 disciples. When you look at these 12 men, in the years after Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven, the disciples faced brutal persecution that often ended in death. Death in ways that because I see younglings here today, I won't go into. They were that sick and twisted. Think about what they faced. Think about this, the brutal persecution. James, or Acts 12, 12, 2, actually tells us this. It's very blunt, and he says this. Check it out. He says, about the time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Listen how sick this is. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Even tells you when he did it. Think how sick that is. He goes and he kills this guy, has him run through with a sword, and then the, the Jews are like, hey, please, let's stamp this out. We applaud. Like, oh, this pleases you. Who else can we kill? Who else is, oh, Peter, he's the big one. Let's get him over here. Think about this. Josephus says the other James, the half-brother of Jesus, was stoned to death by the same Jewish leaders. The second century church father, Origen, he wrote in detail about Peter's crucifixion. These are people who could see it or testify to it or talk to the people who witness it. So much convincing stuff inside and outside the scripture. But I think when you look at every disciple and what faced him, all of them died a martyr's death with the exception of John, who was exiled to die out on an old, horrible, deserted island. And uh, people say, you know what? There's a lot of people who are willing to go, to go to the end of the grave, you know, for their faith. You know what makes Christianity different? If you boil this down and you look... Christianity is the only faith that is unique in that they died for something they saw with their own eyes. No one else thinks about that. They saw the resurrected Jesus. They ran into him. They talked to him. He walked through a, a locked door and said, feel my hands. Put your hand where my spear hole was. And a lot of people have died for something they believed in, but it's always a result of what others have told them. The disciples willingly gave their lives for what they saw with their own eyes. Rather than take the far easier and safe path of just denying the resurrection. They could say, guys, hey, listen, he's gone. We had a good run. It was a lie. We know it was a lie. Let's just sweep it under the rug, and we'll go on with our life. And you know what? Rome would have been really happy with that. 
They would say, hey, do you get it? We all in the same, you, you just wash your hands. Okay, you repent. Yeah, it, was, it was a good lie. Okay, you know, let's go play some poker. But they didn't do that. Think about this. Why on earth would Peter and James, the other James, Paul, all these people, why would these people knowingly, willingly die alone at the hands of various rulers for a lie they purposely fabricated? Think about this. To proclaim the resurrection long after Jesus was now with the Father brought them no fame. It brought them no power, <laughs> just the opposite. Brought them no money, zero status. They could have easily walked away from it. This is the beautiful aspect of it, the total transformation of these guys. Remember, before the resurrection, sometimes they were cowards. But after the resurrection, they're bold. Peter, before the resurrection, he was so scared, he didn't even admit he knew Jesus to a little young slave girl warming her hands around the fire. He was that scared before the resurrection. After the resurrection, think about this. He is so bold. He is speaking. Him and John are talking to so many people. When the high priest and leaders see it, check out what it says. It says, they saw the courage of Peter. They saw John. They realized, these are unschooled, ordinary, hippie men. They don't know this stuff. And they were, what's the word? Astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So let me ask. When we leave this, this room, our gatherings, when people see us, do they take note and say, these people have been with Jesus? Man, what a blessing to be labeled somebody who knows the Lord, who had been with Jesus. The beauty of the resurrection is the transforming power that it brings. Guys, Peter was changed by it. John was changed by it. You know millions of people throughout the ages have been changed by it. And today, you and I are changed by it. If not, you've not had that moment, you can have that moment today when we come and we accept what he did on the cross on our behalf. Not only does the forgiving and healing power of the resurrection affect our future, but here's the beautiful thing. It reaches back and it cleanses our past. That's what it means when we think about the blood of the, the lamb cleansing and erasing it, making all of our sin white as snow. It takes all my failures and it cleanses it, it forgives me, and it makes us beautiful again. God takes our worst moments and the resurrection takes our deepest regrets. And if you don't know what your deepest regret is, it's probably something that races through your mind when you're laying in bed alone at night with just your thoughts. That thing you wish you could do over. The resurrection takes our deepest regrets and transforms them from unbearable shame to God's amazing grace to beauty, to making something out of the ashes of our life. My failure is no longer my shame. Not because I'm good, but because he's good. Because <laughs> he is awesome. You know, I love when people talk about Jesus' brother. He had a half-brother named James. This is probably the greatest of all 12 of them, if I could pick. When Jesus uh, rose from the dead, we see something amazing here. In John chapter 7, verse 5, it says, Before the crucifixion, James didn't even fully believe in Jesus. This is his brother. Nobody knew him better. He didn't even really fully believe in him. But after the resurrection, James is changed. In fact, he becomes the central lead elder of the original church. He was pastor of the Potter's Hand Bible Church Jerusalem campus. That was his job. He was the very first guy. Don't gloss over this. All right? I want to bring this home. You know, I love to get practical. I want you to think about your brother or your sister. <laughs> I want you to picture them right now. Did you always get along? All right, here is an actual picture of me with my two brothers. All right, I'm the guy in the middle with, with the beautiful shop glasses on, getting ready to do some uh, woodworking apparently. But I want you to notice my middle brother glaring at me. No, we didn't, he didn't put that on. That, that's legit. We didn't get along. We didn't get along. Most of the time I'm running to my oldest brother, Jeff, saying, protect me. <laughs> Tim's going to kill me again. And we get along great. You know, everyone's a Christian now, and it's awesome, and I love it. They've already texted Happy Easter and stuff. It's beautiful now. <laughs> now. We didn't always get along. But I'll tell you this. They knew me, and I knew them. Picture Jesus and James. Picture how much interaction they had. You always hear these stories of siblings who grow up in the shadow of someone else. Not long ago, we learned an incredible thing. We learned that Santa Claus actually has a brother. If you didn't know, his name is Fred. Fred Claus 
And there's something amazing that happens in this movie. It's a, it's a silly, goofy movie, but Fred is always envious because he's in the shadow of his famous older brother, Santa. And when they come together, there's friction, especially when they try to have that family dinner. But there's this really cool moment where all the brothers who are living in the shadow of their famous one get together and have a therapy session. It's a support group called Siblings Anonymous. And they get together, and they're always talking about things like, he's in the spotlight, or I'm not as smart, or I'm not as athletic, and you get the idea. And there's all these famous people. Like, this is Frank Stallone, and his brother obviously is Sylvester Stallone. The guy on the far right crying is Roger Clinton, whose big brother is Bill Clinton. So they really got the guy. The guy standing up, Stephen Baldwin, whose brother is the famous actor Alec Baldwin. And they have this beautiful moment where they're sitting there, and they're going through it. Here's the difference, guys. Jesus was perfect. When you bring this back, imagine growing up in the home of the one who legit was perfect. Andy Stanley wrote a book called Irresistible, and he asked a profound question. He says, what would your brother have to do to convince you he was the son of God? Uh, something huge? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it have to be like rise from the dead? It would have to be something unbelievable. And it is a great point. We don't think about this. Look at the disciples. Before the crucifixion, every single one of them floundered. Most of them deserted, and some literally ran for their lives, running away. But after the resurrection, something changed them to where they're boldly proclaiming the message of his death and his resurrection. If you haven't experienced that kind of transforming power, today can be your day. And if you've already put your faith in Christ, and today is your day to move out boldly, like the disciples, to finally say, that's it. I'm done playing games. I'm done being a 007 Christian where I kind of hide in the crowd. And if you look closely on the right day, you might be able to tell I'm kind of a believer. But where we unashamedly and boldly declare, Jesus is Lord. Today is that day. The resurrection, the cold, hard, lifeless tomb is negated. Hundreds of people witnessed that the tomb was empty. I love seeing it when you see a chart like this. You've got all these great descriptions of where Jesus showed up after he's risen from the dead. Matthew 28 is obviously a big one, but look at the third one from the bottom. Jesus appeared to a crowd of 500 people at the same time, right? That's, picture this crowd and then double it. You know why this is so amazing scientifically? Because you can't say it was a hallucination. Hallucinations are not mass events. They saw it. It wasn't one at a time. Jesus poofed out and said, hey, hey, go tell somebody else. He was there, and everybody could say it. And you know what else they could do? They could refute it. They could come back and go, what are you talking about, Peter? We were there. We never saw such a thing. Not a single person came forward and said, hey, you're making this up. That's, to me, so amazing is the reaction of those who, who don't believe. Matthew 28, 13 says there's little debate whether the tomb was empty. Even the detractors, the enemies, admitted it was. And here's a little giveaway. Rather than say, hey, Jesus' body is, is, uh, is still there, the Jewish leaders go and bribe the guards with a large sum of money, and they say this. They say, here's what I want you to say. Go say his disciples came during the night, and they stole the body while, while you were sleeping, Right? And I know if the guards get in trouble, and if everybody gets, don't worry about it. If it gets to the governor, we'll, we'll take care of that too. We're going to get another bribe and all that. You, did you catch that? The priests don't believe, and so they provide a, a story to <clears throat> have a plausible explanation about the empty tomb. The guards, we can do it. We can handle all this. Never mind the fact that these guards who supposedly fell asleep on watch would be executed. They're not going to go lie about this. They're not going to go take this. Torture and death awaited those who insisted that they fell asleep. More than 500 witnesses saw it. Not one came forward to refute the empty tomb. You know what's wild to me about this? Is if you're looking for a place of hope, if you're looking for a place to go to relax, to connect with others, I guarantee you none of us are going to pick this place right here. Right? None of us are going to pick a creepy graveyard. You know why? Because that represents death. That represents where we go for the dead. It's depressing. It's lifeless. It's the last place we would go. But the resurrection does more than just put a nice little happy smiley face on a tombstone. It shows you he is alive. It shows you you have hope. This is the transforming meaning of the grave itself. In fact, that's your next truth grenade today. Hope is now found in the tomb 
because Jesus was not found in the tomb. Hope rose from the dead in the form of Jesus, and it changes everything. I love how Clarence Hall put it. He said, death is no longer a prison, but it is a passage into God's presence. The resurrection literally changed the face of death for all his people. Easter says, well, you can lie about it. You can put truth in the grave, but it won't stay there. It's coming back. This completely transforms us. So let me ask you a question. Is your life transformed? If it is, then you probably know the Savior. If it's not, then today is a day you can know the Savior. This is the beautiful thing. The invitation is open. Without the resurrection, guys, death is just a tragic end of life. Like, oh, our strength gave out. That was it. It's a good run. <laughs> With the resurrection, death is the passageway to life. It's where our true glory begins. I love how Paul puts it. Colossians 3, he says this. So then, since you have been raised with Christ, now I want you to start seeking the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We know where Jesus is. For you died. Your life's now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, comes back, when he appears, you also will appear with him in glory. There's a promise for you. It's not just about this life. It's also the life to come. The great Chinese leader, uh, Watchman Nee, put it this way. He says, our old history ends with the cross, and our new history begins with the resurrection. Isn't that awesome? Anybody have a past they wish they could just erase? You don't have to raise your hand. If you want to, you can. We'll hear your story. But no, I'm just kidding. You won't do it. Anybody have a past? Absolutely. <clears throat> the resurrection paves over that and makes us new. The resurrection doesn't make us a little bit better. <laughs> It's not a little stepping stone on the road to self-improvement. It's not a positive, happy, clappy thing like, hey, you can do it. Just tell yourself in the mirror, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people love you. It's not about being good, you know that? We're human. If you're human, you're broken. If you're broken, you're separated from God. Thankfully, God doesn't leave us separated. He's not like us. There's no duplicity. We're not like he is. He's holy and perfect. We're selfish. We have moments of greed. If you don't believe me, just remember a few years back in the pandemic when some of y'all hoarded a year's supply of toilet paper. <laughs> and you drove by Sheets gas station and you witnessed with your own eyes people filling up gas bags full of gasoline and trash bags that lasted about a block before they disintegrated. Now we're selfish. You don't have to teach a baby to cry for his own way. We're, it's inherited. We know that. We see that. Well, some people say, you know what? If God wants to separate himself from me because I'm human and broken, well, then I don't want anything to do with a God like that. And I get that, but I want you to hear this. It's not God that separated himself. We separated ourselves. Romans 3.23 says this. Every one of us, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. There is a gulf. Sin has separated us from a holy God. The resurrection is God's plan to bridge that gap. Imagine a giant cross between that gully, and you can cross because of that. It's beautiful. This is what he does. He sees that we have fallen short, and he says, I'll make a way. You're not going to have to do it. I will hurl all of your sin, past, today, future, onto the blameless sacrifice, my son. He will go, and he will willingly surrender and accept your punishment is the perfect, innocent, blameless sacrifice. Your only requirement is to repent of that sin and to agree and confess he is the Lord. He is the Savior. God has extended this invitation to us. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite our musicians back up, and I want to I leave you with, with kind of a story here that will kind of illustrate this. This would be like this invitation. Say I'm throwing an epic party at an incredible mansion like this, Okay. Uh, this, is, this is actually Pastor Jason's home in Sanford, so <clears throat> you're all invited there afterwards. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt. Imagine Pastor Jason has graciously offered his mansion for us to come, and I'm so excited, and I'm, I'm the party master, and I come to you with an invitation, and I say, listen, man, we are so excited that you're coming to the party. I cannot wait to have you here. When you arrive to get into the party, all you have to do is have this. Imagine the response if it was, oh, oh, wait a minute. If I got to have an invitation, 
I ain't coming. I don't, I don't want to go to that party. And I say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. It's already done. It's already paid for. It's my party. I mean, I get to make the rules, but I've already handled it. The, the caterers here, everything. It's going to be awesome. I mean, look at that. We got a slide. It's going to be, it's already been paid for. Imagine the person saying, ah, I don't, I don't want to have the invitation. Jesus has already given the invitation to everyone. It's us. Now, it's, on, it's in our lap. Are we going to do this? Are we going to reject it? The resurrection is open to anyone who will put their faith in Jesus. He doesn't make it complicated. He doesn't make it hard. Romans 10 says this. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There it is. That is so clear and simple, even I could figure that out. See, we like to complicate things because it makes us feel better, like we figured it out or like we, like we had something to do with it. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with you. It is all about Jesus. This is what he says. And if you don't want him on earth, he's not going to force you to endure him forever. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate that way. It is a gift. Remember, God is not calling you to be better. He's not calling you to be nicer. He's not saying, go figure it out on your own. Get yourself cleaned up, and when you get your act together, you come to me and maybe. No, no, no. You bring your mess to the cross, and he cleans it up. Satan, the enemy, loves you to think of it backwards. You can't be good enough. You can't clean up your mess and say, oh, I'm going to get right. If I came to that church, it would fall in on me. You don't understand. No, no, no. I get it. We've all been there. You come to the cross with your mess, stain and all, and he is the one who forgives and cleanses. To accept his invitation means now it's time to lay down your pride, to lay down your weakness, all your baggage, all the stuff that has stressed you out, and look to the goodness of God to make you good. It's all about the cross and the resurrection. So if that's the journey you want to begin today, and you'd like to accept that invitation, you can do that. Scripture tells us it's not hard. Very quietly, would you just bow where you are? Just close your eyes. Tune out all the distractions. And if you feel kind of the Holy Spirit just tugging at your heart, you know something's, something's clicking today, and you're like, man, this is, this is for me, then I just want you to just pour out your heart to the Lord. Just pray with him. It's a conversation. It's not a, it's not a monologue. Just talk to him. In your own words, just tell him, Father God, I admit that I'm separated from you. I confess, just as your word said, that I've done wrong. I don't pretend it's not there. I don't sweep it under the rug. I, I confess that I've fallen short, just like everybody in this room. But today, I want to be made new. I ask your forgiveness. Will you cleanse me? I repent of my sin. I turn my back on it. I see the price that you paid on the cross price you didn't even owe and I accept it I confess you are Lord I believe you rose from the dead like your word says I claim that promise that if I believe and I confess I will be saved and I want to take part in the resurrection we've talked about today I repent of my sin and I invite you now Holy Spirit fill my life take control from this day forward you are Lord, and you are good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to say something. If you prayed that prayer today, maybe for the first time, based on the Word of God, you are a new creation. Not only do we celebrate, the angels celebrate. But you want to, you don't want, you got to tell somebody about that. Don't keep that a secret. I would love it. If you want to tell me, I, I will rejoice with you. I'm not going like, to get you to fill anything out or make you do anything. I just want to hug you and rejoice with you. Maybe help put you on the, on the steps of the path of how to live a, a life after God's own heart. But tell somebody. Maybe you've done that uh, a time or two and you've rededicated your life today and you're like, you know what? I just want to make a clean break. And I've never really been baptized. We're going to be doing that in a couple weeks, actually. We've had some people express interest in that. It's a beautiful process that declares to the world I am leaving my past under that water. When I come up, I am made new. Maybe you want to talk about that. I'd love to hear about that. Send me a private message. Talk to me after church. Tell somebody. If you're out of town or you're watching online, 
find a church nearby that preaches God's word unashamedly and plug it. We need each other. As these days grow darker, guys, we're going to need friends, brothers, sisters to come along, to link arms, to pick us up when we fall, because we will, to have our back when the world's throwing the stones and, and arrows. You need a local body of believers. So please find that. If it's not here, find it. There's so many great ones around. I was so blessed this morning. My phone was blowing up by pastor after pastor after pastor in this city saying, I'm praying for Potter's hand today. How sweet when brothers dwell together in unity. We need to show that love. So my challenge is as we leave today, and we're going to be done here. I know you got anxious kids ready to go hunt those awesome 3,000 eggs. Resonate love when you go. Demonstrate that. Show that to a world that needs to see love and truth. I'm so excited about what God is doing. If you made a change of heart, please tell me today. And I, I want to bring the lights up, and we're gonna, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dismiss with our call and response. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And then I'm going to show you how we're going to manage this chaos that's about to happen. All right? Let's stand together very quietly, and I want to pray for you before we go. Oh, Lord, what an awesome Resurrection Sunday. God, I thank you. This has been so good for my soul. Thank you for this time with these brothers and sisters who could be anywhere today, but they chose to be in your house on your day. Lord, I pray a blessing on them. I pray you would bless their homes with peace, with joy, with laughter. I pray you would help us be love and light when we walk out these doors, that people would see us and they would say, these are a people who have been with you, our Lord Jesus. We love you. Thank you for the resurrection. It changed everything. We pray in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.